Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. This week, we are recapping Tuesday's congressional midterm elections with some of the smartest political analysis in Mississippi. Hear from political strategist Austin Barber, State Senator John Horn, and analyst Nathan Schrader. And we'll get a look ahead to the next Congress from two winning incumbents, District 2's Benny Thompson and District 3's Michael Guest. Key election insights this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. Even as we record this, control of the U.S. House and Senate remain in question. But we can tell you easily enough who will represent Mississippi in the U.S. House come 2023. First District Republican Trent Kelly beat out Democrat Diane Black Tuesday. The incumbent drew almost 73 percent of the vote. Black won just 28 percent. Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson easily won his reelection bid. He drew about 59 percent of the vote, beating out Republican Brian Flowers. And another big incumbent win went to Congressman Michael Guest in the 3rd District. The Republican drew 72 percent of the vote. Democrat Shawaski Young took just 29 percent. And in the 4th District down south, Mississippi has a new congressman. Republican Mike Ezell easily beat back challenges from Democrat Johnny Dupree and Libertarian Alden Johnson. Ezell beat incumbent Stephen Palazzo in a primary runoff over the summer. Whether these men will serve in a GOP or Democratic-controlled House remains to be seen. According to the Associated Press, as the week ended, 32 seats have yet to be called in the House. But Republicans are much more likely winner of control given the tallies that we have so far from across the country. And there are four races yet to be called in the U.S. Senate. Two Republicans are vying for a win in Alaska. Vote counting is still underway in bipartisan contests in Arizona and Nevada. And the closely watched race between Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker won't be decided until a runoff election on December 6th. Two veterans of Mississippi politics joined us Tuesday night for election coverage. Both agree neither party can point to a voter mandate coming out of this vote. My colleague Melanie Christopher and I have talked at length with State Senator John Horn and political strategist Austin Barber. Let's talk about the turnout, Senator Horn. Now, we have uh, seen that it's going to be, I think, a historic turnout across the country That's for right. midterm. This seems like people wanted to get out and vote because they are not happy. And uh, you hit the nail on the head, Melanie. Uh, this is a record turnout of 120 million voters, which is very high for a midterm race. Uh, there were about 45 million mail-in votes uh, that came in prior to the, the uh, today's election. So folks are, you know, folks are fired up. But, you know, a poll said, one poll said 71 percent of, uh, of folks in America think that the country's headed in the wrong direction. Another poll said 80 percent think that this election is going to determine the future outcome of the United States. But the folks who are polled are Democrats and Republicans. We're still divided. It's divided, and we talked about this earlier. Uh, um, that's what's got a lot of people upset. We even had people saying that. It's just very divided out there. We are not a united state. Right, and, and neither party is going to get a clear knockout, I don't think, today. And we talked about that, whether this was going to be a red wave, but it doesn't appear that it's going to be the wave that a lot of the pollsters were saying. No, look, I mean, pollsters do the best they possibly can. <laughs> uh, the, the hardest thing about that is to try to predict what the turnout is going to be. You can say that Senator Horn's going to win his next election, you know, 55 45, but it's so hard to predict who's actually going to turn out. But what matters tonight are there four Senate races to, mm -hmm. to decide who's going to have ma the majority, the control of the U.S. Senate. Look, listen, not everybody's having the kind of night Ron DeSantis is having the governor of Florida where he's going to win by nearly 20 points uh, in Florida. That night was an easy and an early one for him. Not, not every race is as easy as what he's done very impressively in the state of Florida. You know, back to the pollsters, I think part of the problem is that there's a growing number of undecided and nonpartisan voters out there. They don't like either party. Uh, they think both parties have been taken over by extreme arms of the parties and they're disgusted with, with what they're seeing, so they, they wait until the last minute. And they may not vote a, a straight ticket. They may pick someone over here and somebody over there. Well, that's certainly happening in Georgia and, for, and Pennsylvania tonight with, with the gubernatorial nominees in both of those states going to win big, but the nominee of their own parties, both the Democrat Party in Pennsylvania and Republican Party in Georgia, struggling right now to try to find a win. So you're exactly right. Ticket splitters 
are, are, are deciding factor in those two massive states. What is, real quickly, what is it going to look like in the next two years uh, with Republicans possibly controlling this, uh, the, the uh, uh, Congress and, and having a Democratic president? I think Americans will like this. Americans do not mind divided government in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. For one party to control the White House and the other party to control Congress, Americans mm -hmm. don't mind that. Yeah, I think we're going to see the end of the January 6th committee. Uh, we may see an investigation of the president if, with the uh, Republicans being in charge of the House. Very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All, all right. right. Thank you, gentlemen. You've been with us all night. We certainly appreciate it. So what should we expect from the next Congress? Two winning incumbents chime in when Mississippi Insight continues. Welcome back. Tuesday night capped off a hard-fought re-election campaign for Michael Guest in the 3rd District. Next year marks a third term for Guest in Congress. He was tested earlier this year after finishing neck-and-neck -neck in the Republican primary with challenger Michael Cassidy. A runoff election confirmed Guest for the general election, which he won easily against Democratic newcomer Shawaski Young. Here's some of what Guest had to say in his victory speech late Tuesday night. And I believe that the American people trust Republicans to lead us back there once again. Tonight I hope will be a turning point in our nation's history. I believe that our fellow Americans, that our fellow Americans are ready for physically conservative leaders. Leaders who believe in limited government. Limited government and leaders who believe that our prosperity comes through lower taxation and through less government spending. I believe that the American people voted for law and order candidates. Candidates who will fight the rising crime that we see in our cities, including right here in our capital city of Jackson. Crime that has left many of our cities in a state of fear and uncertainty. I believe that the people of our great nation have voiced their opinions for candidates who will defend the constitutional principles that have made our nation the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Next door, Mississippi 2nd District Democrat Benny Thompson won his 16th term in the U.S. House. He is the longest serving African American elected official in the state, and he will remain the one and only Democrat in Mississippi's congressional delegation. He made clear Tuesday night finishing the work of his select committee on the January 6, 2021 attack on Congress is a top priority. Well, obviously, we had to finish this congressional year out. Uh, we operating on the continuing resolution uh, until mid-December. Uh, we have a budget to adopt. We have to make sure that uh, the funding that comes to states uh, for health, safety, agriculture, all those things come forward. And then I look forward to working uh, with the new Congress. Uh, we're not sure whether Democrats will be in charge or uh, Republicans, but either way it go, we're all Americans and we have to do what's best uh, for our citizens. Uh, the good thing is it appears that some of the things that went with January 6th didn't occur uh, tonight, and that's thankful. I hope the people have gotten a message that in a democracy uh, it's your votes that count and once the count is made uh, you can ask for a recount you can go to court uh, but you don't riot or try to tear, tear the place up. Up next an inside veteran rejoins us for his take on the midterms and what's in store politically for our nation. We're back in a moment. Fans of this program will recall Dr. Nathan Schrader from his analysis. He is the former director of the American Studies program at Millsaps College in Jackson, and he continues to follow election affairs in his new job at New England College in New Hampshire. He joined us last week with his insights. In Congress and the congressional races, the Republicans are expected to win the House, but that still hasn't been called yet. Uh, what is going on there, and why is that still tough to call that, and why are Republicans uh, really close on that and not having that wave that we expected. 
Right. The wave didn't the the wave didn't come in the House. The wave didn't come in the Senate. And the Democrats had a better night than expected in the governor's races. But specifically with the House, the Republicans are going to have the edge there. They're going to have the majority right now with the decided races. It's 210 to 200, according to CNN just now. Uh, So there's there's still what, about 25 seats where there it could go either way or it's leaning one way or the other, but hasn't been called. Um, the Republicans will have a majority, but it's not going to be anything like the size of the majority they expected. Kevin McCarthy is going to have a really hard job as as he plans to uh, ascend to speaker. He's going to have a smaller majority than expected, but also a more MAGA-friendly majority party to deal with. So he's going to have to he's going to have to be fighting the, off the Democrats on some issues on one hand and trying to keep his caucus happy on the other. Now, I think what happened here was a, a, a confluence of factors. It wasn't just one thing. It was uh, the, the Democrats, I think, were on the ropes all summer. They were on the ropes all fall, and they simply closed out the campaigns in most of these, these critical states and districts. They closed well. Their arguments seem to be much more focused than the Republican arguments, and their candidates seem to be just stronger recruited candidates. And I think that's that's attributed to the lack of the Republican wave. What does it say if you're President Biden? What is he thinking now? And is he happy with what the results are, uh, no matter whether they take the House or the Senate? Or what do you, what, what do you think he, he's feeling? Well, given that Joe Biden is one of the, uh, the uh, is a lifelong political animal, right? He's always been uh, at the forefront of what's going on in the partisan battles in each election year, even when he's out of office. He's, needless to say, he's probably elated to see that his party was able to hold off the wave. And, out, and he was worried, I think, about being one of those presidents that in the future years, on shows like this, we'd be referencing, oh, remember, this is gonna this is gonna be like that year Joe Biden took that beating in the midterm, right? He he'll avoid that now. And it's got to influence, in my mind, the possibility of his running for for re-election, because I don't think there were a whole lot of people that expected Joe Biden to emerge from the midterm elections looking to be in a stronger position than he was going in. And I think he's, again, he's got to be over the moon at where he is politically right now. What if the Republican Party, what are they thinking right now about where they're standing? Look, I think the Republican Party, you're already seeing this today. Some of the conservatives who kind of went along with Donald Trump for a few years, uh, they're questioning now whether he's really the person to be at the helm of the party. But at the same time, I think there's no doubt in my mind, this is his party still. If he announces that he's running for president like he is in a few days, there's no doubt in my mind right now that he will be the Republican nominee. So even though they're questioning Trump right now in terms of is he the guy to lead the party, I don't think they have any choice because the rank and file Republican voters are for him. And there's no one that could beat him or challenge him within the party. Let's talk about what happened in Florida. Governor Ron DeSantis easily won that race, uh, and a lot of Hispanic voters voted Republican. He won the Miami-Dade area uh, handily down there. What does that say about Florida? Look, I, I think there's two states. As I was as I was looking at the state by state results come in last night, I said that Democrats and Republicans are probably both making a similar calculation. Democrats saying. Are we going to keep in, going to keep investing all this money every two years in the midterms and then the presidential in Ohio and in Florida? Because every year they feel like they've got to invest a lot of money there, and every year it fizzles. And this year they really took a bad beating in both states. And so on the Florida end, DeSantis, I believe, is sort of the the, the rising star of the Republican Party. But he's going to be held back because he's got an ambitious ex-president at the helm of the party. And I don't think he's any match for Trump just yet in terms of the base, the organization. He's going to get there someday. I think he's a more of a 2028 nominee than a 2024 nominee for the GOP. But his victory was very impressive, beating a former governor that badly. What did voters say, or what was the message from voters yesterday uh, uh, about this election since there wasn't a wave 
and we're, we're pretty a 50 50 split now here the voters in my estimation were saying two things they're saying we're not pleased with the with the rate the inflation and the economy right now we've got concerns about crime and the border what's going on at the southern border and we're not 100% sold on on Joe Biden's like solutions or the problems but at the same time they're saying we see what the alternative is and we don't like it <laughs> it was i think the republicans nominated some candidates in critical races who were so extreme and so far outside of the mainstream that they were able to give the voters enough reason to take a second look at the democrats and they were saying we know what we've got there maybe it'll improve but i'm not willing to go this far in the other direction so what does this going to look what's washington going to look like if republicans have control of the house democrats have control of the senate and and the white house that's one of the great ironies here byron is the voters Voters routinely say they want more cooperation and consensus building and bipartisanship in politics. Then on, then on the other hand, they hate gridlock. So what do they do? They elect a, uh, you know, we've got a Democratic president. Or we could have a, you know, potentially have a Democratic Senate. We're going to have a Democrat or a Republican House. That's going to lead to more partisan divide and more gridlock. So the voters are they're asking for two things that aren't necessarily compatible more cooperation and less gridlock that's not so compatible with the scenario that we're going to be gov we're going to be governing under come january can washington do something work together when it comes to the economy and inflation or was that some one thing that they might be able to agree on i hope so uh, the, the thing i'm i'm going to be watching very closely is if they can forge enough of a consensus to avoid a long-term uh, default on the the the, uh, the debt ceiling because if you remember, uh, the Republicans had threatened that it, when that comes up again, if they control the Congress, they are going to make the president, they're going to force them to the negotiating table and use that to force cuts in Social Security and Medicare. Their hand is a lot weaker right now than it was a couple of days ago uh, before the election. So I don't know if they're going to be able to force those cuts on, so, on the social safety net that they had promised. And so that'll be the first battle I watch before we even get to the inflation question. Can anything be done there? What happened on Tuesday? Does this affect what could happen in 2024? Well, definitely. Uh, because look, I think the Democrats learned a lesson here. It, it's when they put up a fight, voters pay attention. Because, you know, we've heard in all the elections past, that the Democrats don't fight back. They just sort of take the, their lumps, right? And here in the last, this is where I said earlier, they close strong in this, this election cycle. So when they push back on what the Republicans were saying about them, it helped them. It, it made voters pay attention to that. So I think they've learned a lesson. Just don't take their lumps. They've got to, they've got to push back when they're attacked. Now, the Republicans... I think they're locked in this position where they may the, the the party elders likely know that they need to make some changes, but again they're saddled with forty five right, and they're gonna they're kind of caught in in the crosshairs of Trump and his ambitions, and they're going to have to sort that out before they can really take away much uh, from twenty twenty two to apply it to twenty twenty four. So if Trump runs, do you believe that Joe Biden will run again? As of, so I'm going to carefully say, as of today, I think that would be the case. That if Trump, if Trump decides he's going to run, and I think that could happen officially in a few days, I think that would likely force Joe Biden's hand to seek re-election. And, and a rematch uh, plays out in 2024. I know it's too far out to predict how that rematch would go, but uh, do you think it would be a, a big race like it was in uh, uh, in, in uh, 2020? I think it would be a big race, but there's there's another piece to consider here. Americans don't seem to want either of them to run, <laughs> and so here's this is this is this this is the scenario. You have two candidates who are who are going to win their nominations because of the party 
nominating process, where, which they'll both dominate. But they're not necessarily candidates that the public is saying that that's who they want to see as the presidential contenders. That is a little different than the last time. Remember, Joe Biden was challenging Trump from the outside, saying, you know, he's the guy that can bring the country back together. You know, we see that in these election results and others. The country's not necessarily together, but the tone of the country is certainly different. You don't have the the daily tweeting and the the press conferences encouraging people to you know inject themselves with bleach to get rid of a, a, a virus. But it's a different tone that we'll see in 2024 because the country's changed a lot in the last two years. Big thanks to Nathan Schrader, John Horn, and Austin Barber for great work in our election analysis this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown from all of us here at 12 News. Make it a great weekend.